Uh, thank you very much, Ryan, and, and welcome to a, a special evening where we're going to be discussing simple and effective balanced portfolios for lifetime investing success. Uh, welcome, Chris. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Thanks, John. It's good to be here. Uh, I am the director of research at the Merriman Foundation, and uh, we at the Merriman Foundation are committed, much like the AAI, just to educating people. We don't make any money. The foundation was created out of a grant from Paul himself, and uh, we're we're basically your conflict-free friend. <laughs> so, uh, we, you know, we don't have those three-letter acronyms after our names, but we do a lot of heartfelt research. Uh, we're we're very inquisitive. We have access to some interesting data, and our goal is to to help people invest better and. My work at the Merriman Foundation has involved things like the two fund for life strategy, the best in class uh, asset uh, or ETF recommendations that we update periodically and some of the other recommendations for funds on the site. So I'm really excited to be here tonight. I think the intersection of our goals and the AAII's goals are, are really great. And uh, the opportunity to have, you know, just to kind of sit down with a thousand friends is kind of cool or, or maybe more. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree with you more there, Chris. Uh, I, I love the work you do as far as analyzing past trends and doing various backtesting. How did you get involved in the process? Well, you know, back in about 2015, like a lot of people, as I was getting close to retirement, I decided it was time to become a knowledgeable investor instead of just a, an investor. And so I, I spent a lot of time reading and listening to podcasts and um, doing online webinars like this one and going to AAII seminars. And I came across uh, Paul's work and reached out to uh, to get in, involved with him. And um, he was very willing to take a volunteer, which was kind of cool. So uh, the, the work I do, I, I my background is engineering. I think a lot of people who are engineers become analytical kind of quant like investors right and so that engineering background meant i wanted to see the data i wanted to really understand why whatever investing strategy i was pursuing made sense and the best way to really understand anything is to teach it so the opportunity that i have that i have working with paul to not just understand these things, but then to challenge myself to understand them well enough to explain them to other people, I think makes me a better investor and hopefully helps other people on their journey to doing the same thing. Yeah, I could agree with you more. It's amazing how much more detailed information you have to gather yourself just to even write something simple. You really, it's, I find it enjoyable. It's a bit like solving a, a puzzle, uh, yes. but uh, you, you have to almost, uh, Overlearn something and then be able to explain it down down to a, a simple form. And I, I forget if it was uh, uh, Mark. I don't think it was Mark Twain, but someone I remember believe once said, "I'm writing you a long letter, enough time to write a short letter for you." So I think, uh, but I I I, I, read, I you've got a great article in the uh, uh, in the journal here regarding uh, the price we pay for being different. Uh, that's a great read for our, our our audience out there. And I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation as well. Uh, with that, why don't you take it away, Chris? Okay, thank you, John. Let me uh, put this slide presentation in presentation mode. Are you guys seeing this? Yes. Yes, we are, Chris. And, and we are, All right. The presentation looks like. Cool. Right now. Uh, I'm on the wrong slide, so that's my bad. And. There we go. Okay. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about simple and effective balanced portfolios for lifetime investing success. And this is a follow up in many respects to a presentation Paul made last month that dealt only with the equity side of portfolios. So that presentation dealt with some of the simple portfolios we'll look at tonight, but only equities, only stocks. Almost nobody really invests in just equities. Um, I shouldn't say that. A lot of AAII people are firmly committed to an all equity portfolio, but most people like to uh, have a little bit of a, a break or a buffer uh, by investing also in some bonds. And so most of these portfolios, in fact, all of these portfolios will have some bonds in them. 
so this is a follow-up to that presentation. Before we get into it, though, I did want to say just a little bit about my journey at Merriman. And we, we touched on this in the discussion I had up front with John, but um, I wanted to give you a feeling for what it's been like for the last few years to work in the Merriman organization. When I first discovered Paul, his website, his podcasts, I really imagined him to be a bit of a financial wizard. Um, this is not a picture he endorses, but it's one that I created out of my imagination, if you will. I thought that if I could work with Paul, I could learn the secrets of financial wizardry. And in fact, my, my early bio on the website said Wizard's Prentice because I wanted to learn from the wizard. But what I learned working with Paul in, in very short time is that he's really a teacher. Uh, where he comes from is that he's inquisitive, he asks interesting questions, he challenges me, and because he's a teacher, he needs to learn so that he can teach, and uh, he, he basically let me join him on that path. He let me uh, join him as somebody who is curious and learning and learning to teach. And we did some basic things up front, but as we worked a little bit farther in time, what became clear to me is one of the really core things that we have in the Merriman Foundation that's valuable is a set of asset class histories. We have the ability to model what past experiences would have been like. And working with Daryl Balls, our director of analytics, we've extended that set of asset class histories in the time that I've been in the organization. We've taken it all the way back to 1970 for all of the major asset classes that, that we model and we'll talk about tonight. Uh, we didn't use that data last month because it's this is new work, but I'm gonna use it tonight and I think you'll get a different perspective on how international and US portfolios do. Because we have this history, we can use it now as a bit of a time machine. Um, I know this is a really nerdy reference to Doctor Who, but um, that's who I am, right? So, uh, you know, I grew up with my kids watching Doctor Who, and we we thought we thought it was entertaining. It's neat to be able to go back in time and see how an investing strategy would have done. Now, we have a very fuzzy, if non-existent, crystal ball, but history is the best guide we've got. And if we can find something that worked, say, 590 out of 600 time periods that we can analyze that kind of suggests that it might work in the future, right? So it, the journey I've had with Merriman has been from um, really being a little bit of a, a fanboy to being a, a deeply appreciative um, participant in the process of trying to explain how past history of returns can teach us about what probably or hopefully will help us out in the future. And we're gonna apply that tonight. So why are simple balanced portfolios exciting? The, the first and most important thing is that they give us some knobs, some knobs to tune on return and risk, and they let us improve the amount of return we might get per unit of risk. The second thing is that for somebody in retirement, they can drive a higher safe withdrawal rate or a higher survival rate of our portfolio. For most retirees, those are pretty fundamental concerns. And then the final thing is they're simple. So we can implement the strategies I'm gonna talk about tonight with only between one and five funds. Those could be ETFs or mutual funds, but they're simple enough that I, I really don't think anybody should find the complexity a barrier. So uh, let's look at that, just you know how that plays out on a chart here. We've got on the horizontal axis, I've got risk, let me get a highlighter here. So um, this is the worst 40 year drawdown risk. So imagine you had a 40 year investing experience in the history that we're going to be using from 1970 to 2019. Um, the worst drawdown that the S&P 500 would have experienced was typically about 50%. Um, and the return that you would have gotten from that, investing $1,000 per year on a monthly basis over 40 years, would have gotten you to a little bit over $900,000. All of the strategies we're gonna talk about tonight are these little dots up here, right? So they're farther up and to the right. They're farther in this direction, which is the good direction, because that means they're lower risk and higher return. 
The other reference we're gonna use tonight is a target date fund. And then finally, the Vanguard Life Strategy Fund. In fact, we'll start with the Vanguard Life Strategy, um, but we'll get there in just a couple of slides. So what are we gonna cover? First of all, what's a balanced portfolio? Second of all, what can we do with one to four funds in a fixed allocation? Third, what could we do if we started with a target date fund, added a few funds? And then we'll look at them both in accumulation and retirement, because I know that some of you have children who ask you for advice. Some of you may be young people who are looking for what to do in accumulation. And some of you are nearing retirement or planning on early retirement. So hopefully we'll address all of those. And then finally, we'll look at what do we give up by being simple and hopefully have plenty of time for questions. So what's a balanced portfolio? This is from Investopedia. Um, maybe not the most authoritative source, but it was the one I could find. It says, a balanced investment strategy is a way of combining investments in a portfolio that aims to balance risk and return. Typically, balanced portfolios are divided equally between stocks and bonds. Note it says typically, not always. And we're going to look at a variety of ways to balance a portfolio. So one way, straight up, is what we just read. You could have a portfolio that's one half in bonds and one half in stocks or equities. Another way you could balance a portfolio is you could say, I'm gonna have one half in US and one half outside the US. And in fact, you could do both of these at exactly the same time. You could have a bond fund that's half in the US and half outside the US and a stock uh, fund that's half in the US and half outside the US. And with those two funds, you would be balanced in both of those ways. A third way is you could say, you know what, most of the risk and return for stocks comes from something called market risk. And the return for bonds can come from credit or term risk. We'll talk more about these a little bit later, but you could say, I wanna be balanced across those characteristics, or you could go full factor. And again, we'll talk more about factors in a little bit and say, I wanna divide my portfolio evenly across a lot of different factors. Or finally, you could say, you know what? What I really care about is that my risk be managed not just across factors or geographies or equities and bonds, but I want it to be managed appropriately for my age. And you could uh, use a target date fund. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, all of these different approaches as we go through the presentation. So let's, let's start super simple. Let's look at a one fund strategy. So you could go to Vanguard and you could look at their life strategy funds and you would see that they have four basically different choices and they, they uh, go in increasing stock allocation from 20% to 40% to 60% to 80%. And they have names, this is the income, lifestyle income, life strategy income, Vanguard Life Strategy Conservative, Life Strategy Moderate Growth, and Life Strategy Growth. And they describe the risk as increasing, going left to right, and they have on their website these, these allocations so you can see them. Well, using the, the time machine kind of thing I talked about earlier, using our backtest history, we can take a peek and see, well, how would these have done for every one of the 600 start dates or, or um, all the different 40 year periods of time associated with 600 different start dates in our 50 year history. And if we look at it that way, what we get is um, two measures, the compound annual growth rate, which is gonna be a measure of return and the worst single drawdown. So that's peak to trough. You can think of it as, um, you know, the market was high and you were excited and then it started going down and it kept going down and you were getting depressed and it went down and down and down until it was down a certain percentage before it turned around to come back going up, right? So this is your measure of pain. And the most conservative strategy, the 20% stock strategy, has a return of five and a half percent and a drawdown risk of 12%. Now, this is a little bit of a conservative way to look at this because you get your compound rate of return effectively almost, you don't get it every single year, but the effect at the end is as if you had seen it every single year. 
you only experience the drawdown, the worst case drawdown, once or twice along your whole experience. But I wanted to be conservative and I wanted to describe it in a way that I think relates to how consumers or investors feel it, right? So, you know, if you're going to put me in a strategy that's going to let me lose 12% somewhere along the way, I want to know about that because that's the price. And if I get 5.5% as my compound rate of return over, over time, I want to know because that's the measure of how much benefit I'm getting out of this investment strategy. So if we go over to the 40% stock, we see a very big jump in the return. It goes up to 9.1%, but we also see a substantial jump in the drawdown. And in fact, as you go across the chart, you go to 9.9 and 10.6 and to minus 32% and 42. And basically you conclude looking at this chart that as returns go up, the risk goes up as well, right? It fits with our intuition. It's what you would expect. But I'm gonna show you some examples that point out that we don't always have to live with exactly that trade-off the way it's shown on the chart. <clears throat> we can do one other thing. When we look back at the performance of these funds, we can peek inside and we can see what the characteristics of the funds were that drove the return. And that's this bottom thing called factor diversification. And I'm gonna give you a brief tutorial on factors in just a second, but before we get there, um, let's just take a look at this slide and, and hopefully it'll all make sense when we finish it out. So these two factors, credit and term, come from bonds. The market factor, it comes from the investment in stocks. And what you see when you come over here, as you go across the chart, is that the market factor is coming to dominate. So by the time you're over at an 80-20 strategy, 80% in stocks and 20% in bonds, almost all of the risk and consequently all of the reward, all of the compensation you're getting for the risk is coming from a single factor um, and that's the market factor, which is a lot like investing in the S&P 500 or the total market. So the most diverse portfolio from a factor standpoint here is actually this one on the left, the 20% stock, 80% bonds. And let's go take a look at factors now so that we can understand why that would matter, why we would care. And I find it helpful to step out of the world of finance for a minute when we talk about factors because they sound mysterious, difficult, kind of academic and maybe esoteric. So let's step out of, out of the world of finance and let's think about cars for a second, right? If somebody came to you and said, what characteristics do you think high mile per gallon or high gas mileage cars have? You would probably have a, a, a list of ideas. You'd have a set of ideas of what things make a car have high gas mileage. And if I asked multiple people, I'd get multiple answers. One person might say, well, they tend to be lightweight. They have smaller engines, maybe fewer cylinders, not as many doors, and lower air resistance. And it's, you know, if you pick the cars that had those qualities, they probably would have higher miles per gallon. Another person would say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, electrics and hybrids, those have really, they, they you know, near infinite gas mileage. They're not as long, like the longest cars on the road are gonna have lower gas mileage and they're definitely not four wheel drive. They might be all wheel drive, but not four wheel drive. And then finally, somebody might say, you know, well, they have smaller gas tanks, fewer seats and cup holders. They're not SUVs, trucks or vans. So the reason I bring up these three differences is they might all actually work. <laughs> they might all tell you something about how to find a car that has high gas mileage. Well, the same thing is true in the world of stocks. In the world of stocks, factors is the name that we give to the qualities that drive higher returns. And it's true actually for stocks and bonds. For bonds, you've already been introduced to two factors, credit and term. Credit is basically the compensation you get for the risk that the loan won't be paid back. So when you buy or when you loan the US federal government money, you really don't get compensated for the credit risk very much because they could print money and pay you back. But you do get compensated for this second one. The thing you might get when you loan to the US government by buying a US government bond is the, the term risk. Um, 
But if you loaned money to a fly-by-night business who has a low chance of paying that loan back, you would ask for a very high interest rate, right? You'd ask to be paid a lot of money for it. And that's effectively what the credit risk is. The term risk is how long the loan is. So going back to the, the US government bond from the federal government, if I get a bond from them for a single year, the risk that there's high inflation that's gonna make that bond worth less through the course of the year is relatively small. If I have a 20 year loan though, the risk that there's some period of high inflation along the way that I can't anticipate is reasonably high. 20 years is a long time. Who knows what's gonna happen in 20 years? So the 20 year bond should pay a higher interest rate because it exposes you to more term risk, right? So uh, those are the two, the two terms or the two factors that drive the returns for bonds. And almost everybody agrees to those. When it comes to stocks, you can find models from you can find models from academics like Fama and French. You can find models from AQR and various other practitioners. And they tend to have a few things in common. Market size and value tend to be in common. Um, but they also tend to bring in other complexities like momentum or quality or conservative. And each of the different models is aiming to predict with higher precision how things would have done in the past uh, relative to the reference set of assets, if you will. Um, and they can be really good. They can actually explain the returns in the past for up to 90, 95% of the returns, which is pretty, pretty amazing. The reason I'm only gonna focus on three tonight, market size and value, is that first of all, they are fairly common across the models. And second of all, um, they are the most available in the market and they're also fairly efficient. So you can access them without spending a huge amount of money. Market is basically the risk that you get by investing in the market overall. So it's, it's like beta. So if you invest in an S&P 500 fund or a total market fund, you get a lot of market risk and not, and not much size or value risk. Size is the compensation for investing in companies that are smaller, tend to be volatile, maybe more likely to go out of business, riskier. And so you expect to get a premium for that. You expect, expect to be compensated. And then value is the premium we get for investing in companies that are out of favor. They're not the Googles, not the Facebooks, not the Teslas. These are companies that people think aren't going to do as well. Um, but ironically, historically have done better. And if we look to this point I made about availability, if we look at all of the funds, I did this analysis in October of 2019, and I went to Portfolio Visualizer and I looked for funds that had substantial exposure, it's called load, but it's substantial exposure to the market factor. Loads of funds. You can find thousands of funds that will give you great exposure to the market factor. The small factor, over a thousand funds have access to the small factor. Small in value, a couple hundred funds have good exposure to both of those factors. Under a hundred funds had substantial exposure just to the value factor. And when you start to bring in momentum, you get into the teens. It's just not very many. So it's not to say that momentum is a bad factor or that I wouldn't try to add momentum or look for a fund that has momentum at, you know, exposure. It's just not the, the most fundamental factor I'm gonna focus on tonight. So um, how do factors help balance a portfolio? Uh, this is from Swedro's book, um, your Swedro and Birkin, your complete guide to factor-based investing. And basically the gist of the, the story is that factors go up and down at different times, right? So the market factor, the value factor, and the, um, the size factor tend to do well at different points in time. So a portfolio that has exposure to more than just one of those factors should disappoint less often. And he actually modeled this in the book. And if we look at, let's focus on the five-year time frame. If we look at the five-year time frame. If we had something like an S&P 500 fund, which would give us 
primarily just exposure to the market factor, it might disappoint, it might underperform uh, between five, one time out of five and six at five years. Where in contrast, if we had a, a, a portfolio that had exposure to four factors, it would disappoint only one time out of 20. So you get a more reliable delivery of the premium that you expect to get by investing in a wider range of factors. And this is important because with a small number of funds, we can bring some of these factors in and I'll show you in the back tests how it improves the performance. So let's come back to our, this is our 40% or our 60% stock, 40% bond Vanguard Life Strategy moderate growth fund that we started with. It had 9.9% uh, compound annual growth rate, minus 32% maximum drawdown and heavy concentration in the market risk factor. So if we use three funds and build the same kind of a portfolio, it's a 60% stock, 40% bond, still tilted slightly more to the US than international. This is to match the allocation that's in the Vanguard Life Strategy Fund. And what we end up with is a much higher uh, compound annual growth rate, almost 2%, and we do get a bump in the drawdown. So at first glance, you're probably saying, well, wait a minute, isn't this just the same story we saw before? You're taking more risk, you're getting a higher return. Hold that thought. So down here, we have much, much broader diversification across a range of factors. We would expect, because we have a broader range of factors uh, in our portfolio, to see a better return per unit of risk. And if we compare it to the 80-20 stock portfolio that was available to us before, right? This is a single fund solution. There, we would have gotten 10.6%, so much lower compound annual growth rate at much higher risk, 42% maximum drawdown. So hopefully you're starting to see how using some factors, bringing, some, bringing in some small and some value, we have the chance to improve our diversification and the return that we get per unit of risk. So let's look at how this plays out in a few simple portfolios. Uh, on the left, we have the reference. This is the one we started with, the 6040 Worldwide Stocks and Bonds. The next one I'm gonna bring in here is the, uh, it, this was talked about by Paul last month. We call it a four fund combo. So this is an entire, entirely US portfolio and it's US total bonds. That's where we get our 40% bonds. And then it's a combination of four asset classes, small cap value, small cap blend, large cap value, and large cap blend in equal parts. And so this, because we have those four corners occupied and because the, the market isn't evenly distributed around large and small and value and blend, this gives us some tilt towards the small and the value. And hopefully we'll bring in, as we'll see, some, some exposure to those factors and better return per unit of risk. The other strategy I'm gonna bring in here is the one that we borrowed out of the Bogleheads called Trev H. And it uses basically two of the US funds, the large cap blend and the small cap value, but then it substitutes international funds for the large cap value and the small cap blend. And by using worldwide total bonds as well, this becomes a very balanced worldwide portfolio. And then finally, we'll look at something called a barbell. And this is to illustrate uh, what happens when you use a lot of factor exposure uh, with uh, a, heavy, a heavy amount of bonds at the same time. So I think you'll find it interesting. This is 75% worldwide bonds and then 12.5% in US small cap value and international small cap value. Now I know a lot of uh, AAII investors like it better when we provide tickers. So in the handout material, I've provided uh, both mutual funds and ETFs uh, wherever I could. So there you go, you got the tickers. These are examples, but something important, I use the actual factor weightings that are available within these funds. I didn't use theoretical weights. So hopefully 
what I'm showing you is a practical indication of what you could really do or could have done in the past at least, as opposed to some theoretical model using just theoretical exposures, right? Okay, so over here on the left, this is our familiar column. We've seen that before. What happens with the US four fund solution and US bonds? Well, we go from 9.9% .9 to 10.7%, so we get a good little bump in return. And we go from minus 32% to minus 35%, so only a small increase in the drawdown risk. And we do get some factor diversification, which is what we were going for. But the problem is we're all US, right? I, so this means you've got a lot of exposure to just one market. And um, it would be better, the academics all tell us, we don't get compensated for taking that risk. It would be better if we could diversify internationally. So if we look at this Trev H strategy, it diversifies internationally. It delivers the same performance, 10.7%, and practically the same drawdown and a similar level of uh, factor diversification. So these two end up being almost twins in terms of their level of performance, but the Trev H strategy, again, this is tested from 1970 to 2019, the Trev H strategy provides the worldwide diversification. So finally, let's look at this 2575 barbell over here. And the thing I want you to notice is minus 13% drawdown risk. That is tiny. It's really, really small. So what this is telling us is that by going for a portfolio that spreads its risk relatively evenly across market, credit, term, value, and size, historically, that's delivered a fairly high return for a very low level of risk. And for somebody who's skittish but still wants a good return per unit of risk, um, I think that's a really intriguing kind of option. So that's why we put it in here. So, so far, everything we've talked about has been fixed allocations. Let's take a look now at dynamic allocations. And you may be wondering, well, why? Why would I look at a dynamic allocation? And the motivation is that we all have this characteristic called human capital. And human capital is simply our ability to earn and grow money. And when we're young, when we're, uh, say, 25 years old and we have freshly minted skills and 40 years to work and 40 years to let compounding work for us with our investments, we have a lot of human capital. By the time we get to the middle of our career, eh, it's starting to tail off, but we can still use compounding and our working years to make progress. But by the time we get to 65, our chance to catch up is gone. It's, it's not gone entirely, but our ability to work is only a few years left. Our ability to let uh, compounding work for us is not that great. And so we want to take typically less risk in and near retirement as our, uh, our human capital is declining and our ability to make up for a big loss goes away. So the industry has created this incredible resource called a target date fund. And I've shown over here what is called the glide path for the industry average target date fund. And you can see what it does. It invests in riskier equities in the earlier years and safer bonds in the later years. And it follows a path that very much looks like the path that the human capital follows. So this is, first of all, I think it's a magical thing that we have this available to us. It's incredible. Um, but I, I think the fact that it's available and it's inexpensive is even more incredible. And because it is, it's become the default investment strategy for 401ks across the nation. Uh, you may not use a target date fund, but you almost certainly know somebody who does young people very often default into a target date fund. It's the most popular investment in 401ks and retirement accounts. And the way it works um, at, uh, at any organization is you pick the year in which you're going to retire. So say you're going to retire in 2050, you would pick the Vanguard FIFX, VFIX fund, and they would manage the portfolio so that it followed this glide path and ended up at this allocation 
the one that you should be at, according to them, at retirement. So they would they would manage it. You don't have to do a thing. Super slick, really nice. And we wondered, we wondered, does this do what it's supposed to do? Because um, you know, so many people are investing in it. Does it manage the risk in a way that you would think is most advantageous? So to figure out, this is actually part of the substantial work that we did in the last several years. We had to build a back test tool that lets us test an allocation that's varying over time, which means you can't just run the back test from 1970 forward for 40 or 50 years. You have to say, well, what would happen if I started in 1970, in January of 1970, February of 1970, and so forth and so on, because every experience would be different based on the pattern of returns. So we created that and we looked at the drawdowns. This again is peak to trough, how far would your account have dropped in value? The worst case drawdown was 45%, and it looks like it's doing what it's supposed to do. You've got all of this risk here in the early years, and it's tapered off by the time you retire. Looks pretty good, right? Well, there is a problem on this slide. How many of you started investing at the beginning of your career with a lump sum of money that you were going to plan to retire on? I can't see your raise of hands, but I'm guessing it's pretty close to zero. Every every presentation I've done this in a room full of people, it was pretty close to zero. Most of us start with monthly investments, and usually, you know, in a 401k, uh, our money would go into it every two every two weeks with a paycheck, for example, right? And if we look at what happens when you have monthly investments, all this time over here, where you've got capacity for risk is going unutilized and in fact you don't find your worst drawdown because of the dollar cost averaging until you're about 40 years old and that is a missed opportunity this is a missed opportunity to take more risk and vanguard and others have bonds in the portfolio in these early years which means they're being conservative very conservative so to figure out just to show why this happens why the risk is so low uh, you have to think about how small the balance in your account is when you're a young investor and how big the contributions are that you're putting in. So for monthly contributions, if we go back and we look at the drawdowns for an all equity portfolio, we get a fairly shallow drawdown here in the early years. Um, for a lump sum investment, this was a huge drawdown. So those dollars that are going in are not only clipping these drawdowns, but they're also letting us buy a lot of assets on the cheap. When things are cheap, we buy more. When they're expensive, we buy less. And so um, there's a lot of capacity for risk in these early years that goes untapped. And because of that, we asked ourselves, what kind of a strategy would let us add risk in the early years but still preserve the, the um, characteristic of the risk ramping down towards retirement. And we came up with this thing called two funds for life. The idea is you figure out 1.5 times your age and you use that as a percent and you put that in the target date fund. So let's say I'm 40 years old. <clears throat> At age 40, 1.5 times 40 is 60. I'd put 60% in the target date fund and the remainder, the other 40%, I would put in US or worldwide small cap value. You can also do this with an all value fund or with just an equity fund. They all are likely to improve your result. But the reason I'm gonna model small cap value here is that it's strong sauce, right? I mean, this is, this is the hot sauce. It's the one that's likely to make the biggest difference in how things turn out. So from a teaching standpoint, I think it's the most educational but we do have papers on the website that describe the weak sauce scenarios if that's more appealing or if you just don't have the stomach for the strong sauce. So um, that's the basic strategy of two funds for life. We also said though some people are not gonna have access to a small cap value fund inside their 401k. And for them, it might make sense to put 90% in their 401k in the target date fund and then do 10% into US or worldwide small cap value and just accept that they can't rebalance it. So I'll model that for you. And then finally, 
if you're part of the FIRE crowd, this is the financial independence, retire early crowd. If you're part of that group, you're trying to figure out, well, how do I apply this? You just turn the math around. So instead of using your age, you use the years to retirement and you do 1.5 times the years to retirement and you put that in the second fund and the rest goes in the target date fund. And how does that all look? Well, it ends up looking like this. If your retirement date is 65, kind of a traditional tar uh, retirement date, you've got your second fund ramping down over time and you've got the target date assets ramping up over time. And by the time you get into retirement, you're 100% in the target date fund. Some of you are probably looking at this going, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's so concentrated. You know, you've got this huge bet you're placing over here on the left-hand side of the chart. Well, it turns out you don't have a lot of money on the left-hand side of the chart usually. Most people don't. So when we look at the numbers, and we'll look at them in just a minute, you'll see that this is not an all small cap value chart by the time you average it out and integrate over all of the years that we're doing this. Um, because in those early years when it's such a big bet, I mean, look at the bottom here. This is years zero to 25. So if you look at 20, uh, 25, it's like this line here. By the time you're at 25, you're already diversified. And in these early working years, you don't have as much money. So it's kind of a, a subtle push in the right direction, I think, for your portfolio, but it's, it's not as big a bet as it looks. Okay, let's take a peek at what happened in the past now with these strategies. So the first one on the left is the target date fund. And what you see is it delivered an impressive 10.6% compound annual growth rate with 42% as the maximum drawdown. And you can see that it's got this, you know, this kind of early years, not as much risk as you'd like, but it tapers it off to about 27% by the time you retire. It's broadly diversified and it's heavily concentrated in market risk. So now let's take a look at the 90-10, the 90-10 no rebalancing strategy. Well, you get a higher return, that's good. Very small increase in risk, that's good. You get some factor diversification, that's good. Slight reduction in your geographic diversification, probably fine, but there's a problem. And the problem is that because you're not, you're not rebalancing, the risk nearing retirement goes up. It's, it's just the price you pay. If you can't rebalance between these two accounts, um, the odds over time are that the asset that's got the highest growth potential, which is the small cap value, is going to come to be a bigger part of the portfolio than what you planned. But still, on the whole, an improvement probably. If we look at the next one, this is the one and a half times age and target date fund and the rest in small cap value you get another bump. So you've gone from 9.9 .9 to 11.8%, almost a full 2% increase in the return. Only a 6% reduction or, or deeper maximum drawdown. And uh, you've still given up a little bit of diversification, um, but you've got this nice taper off at the end. And most of the added risk is coming in these early years. And if you go over to the far right, now we've got all of the diversification back because we're using this four fund combination of international funds. We've got an even better return, about the same drawdown risk as the all US strategy and or the all US small cap value and some nice diversification. So these all appear historically across almost every time frame that we've evaluated to imp improve the likely or the expected return um, and improve the expected return per unit of risk. So I promised we would look at this also from the standpoint of retirement, right? Uh, we've got a lot of uh, people who are nearer retirement and they've asked the question many, many times, what happens if I apply to funds for life near retirement? Well, the, the first thing to notice on this chart is that you know, you've got this one and a half times age that's going to zero near where you retire, you're not adding funds for very long, right? These are, uh, you've, just, you've just got maybe five or six years that it's gonna make a difference. So will it make a difference? Kind of an interesting question. From a, an overall return standpoint, not so much. 
the unrebalanced strategy does make a big return difference. It goes up to 10.10 .10 from 9.2. But look at this, you've got, because it's unrebalanced, you've got a big potential for uh, the small cap value growing kind of out of, out of control somewhere in the portfolio. And although that doesn't lead to any worse drawdowns, um, it probably leads to volatility that you might not be comfortable with in retirement. If we look at the drawdown, something interesting is happening here because uh, the target date fund doesn't actually make it all the way to 40 years. All of the other strategies make it to 40 years of retirement. Uh, this one looks like it goes to 100%, and it does go to 100%, but it does it in year 40. So all of the strategies that added even just a little bit of a tilt towards small in value have a safe withdrawal rate of greater than 4% at 40 years. So they all have a safe withdrawal rate down here that is higher by a substantial amount. And when you think how, you know, how little time you're invested to bring those factors in, it makes a pretty big difference. So I think, I think the takeaway for me on this slide for a retiree is that having some amount of uh, equity exposure beyond the normal target date fund, if you're going to be retired for a very long time, could reduce your chances of running out of money. Now, is that something to be terribly worried about? It 98% of people or, or of scenarios tested made it all the way to the end with a 4% withdrawal rate. So you, know, you could also just take a 3.7% withdrawal rate or a 3.6% withdrawal rate and be good. Um, but I, I think the chart says exposure to equities, exposure to small in value a little bit beyond the target date fund is likely to help you out in terms of safe withdrawal rate. So what do we give up by being simple? Um, I'm going to do a side-by-side -side comparison here. On the left, we've got the 60-40 Trev H that we talked about. And on the right, we have the 60-40 Worldwide Ultimate Buy and Hold 13 Fund Solutions. We've got three different kinds of government bonds, and we've got 10 different kinds of equities, including REITs, US and international. And how did they do? Well, I would say pretty close, pretty close to the same. 10.7% um, for the five fund solution, 11% for the 13 fund solution, 36% drawdown for the five fund solution, 35% drawdown for the 13 fund solution. So you know, you give up a lot of knobs, a lot of controls when you go with the simpler approach. And if you're somebody who wants to fiddle and control everything ultra precisely, maybe that's a frustration. But in terms of the actual outcome, I, I, don't, I don't think you give up very much here in terms of being simple versus complex. So let's let's take one more look at simple versus complex. And this is the dynamic allocation in the accumulation years. And I'm gonna use the four fund scenario. So this is the, uh, the one that's got the US small cap value, international small cap value and emerging markets mixed in with a target date fund. And we'll compare that to something that's available on our website called the Merriman Target Date Portfolio Asset Allocation Calculator or Merriman Aggressive Target Date Fund Glide Path. And you can access the calculator here. This uses the same 13 funds. And here you can get a higher return. This is 13% versus 12% at a higher risk, 55% versus 48%. And you have all of the knobs available to you. You can come in here and you can say, I want a target retirement glide path that completes in the year 2032, and it will calculate it for you. Um, you can come in here and say, I want a 68% US, 32% international split, and it will calculate it all for you. So what you really give up, again, is knobs and control. You give up fine control, which, you know, is that substantial for most people? It, it depends on who you are and, and what you value, but I think most people will do just fine with a simple fund. So how did they compare? I said we'd kind of come up with a bottom line summary. How did they compare for accumulators? Well, I think the short summary is that they deliver significantly higher returns for small increases in worst case drawdowns. And you can see it over here on this summary chart. 
If you think of the S&P 500 as a benchmark, well, almost everything on this chart is better than the S&P 500. You can go with higher returns, you can, uh, for, the, for lower risk, so moving to the right here, it's lower drawdown risk with higher returns. Um, you can, if you want, go with the same risk, uh, or I mean lower lower risk at the same returns. You've got a lot of choices, dramatically lower risk with the same returns. If you look at the target date funds, if this is the benchmark, again, it's a move up and to the right. You've got this chance to uh, increase the returns substantially while increasing the risk just a little bit. And if you look at the 60-40 Vanguard life strategy as the benchmark, you've got, again, this opportunity to significantly increase the returns with only a, a minor or you know, fairly insignificant increase in risk. If we look at it for retirees, I think the big story is higher safe withdrawal rates and higher median end balances. So again, if we look at the target date fund as the benchmark, all of the two fund for life strategies are over or up. They're over in this direction. If we look at the S&P 500 as the benchmark, everything is lower risk. It's all to the right in terms of risk. Um, now I've changed the, I, I should have said this at the start, I've changed the axes here. The horizontal axis on this chart is 40 year safe withdrawal rates. So an S&P 500 is kind of in this, call it 3.3% safe withdrawal rate range. So we're moving from a 3.3% safe withdrawal rate with the S&P 500 to something like a 60-40 Trev H portfolio that has almost a 4.5% safe withdrawal rate. Very, very significant change. You almost uh, get to 4.7, 4.75 for the US 4 fund. Um, so I think it's an exciting story. I hope you think it's an exciting story, at least enough to study it more. Um, in summary, the one to five fund simple balanced portfolios have uh, broad diversification across companies, countries, factors, age. They're available inexpensively. They have improved returns per drawdown and accumulation. They have improved safe withdrawal rates and account balances in retirement. What did they give up? Well, they gave up primarily customization, you know, not as many knobs to tweak, the chance to always own what's hot. So that Trev H strategy, it doesn't have any US large cap value. If that's the hottest asset class that year, eh, you might regret that you, you don't have some. The chance to be with the herd, uh, a lot of people get you know really nervous that their portfolio isn't performing as well as the S&P 500. But you know, if that's what you want, then you also ha have to be happy when you're performing as poorly as the S&P 500. So it's kind of a Faustian bargain. Um, I think it's exciting stuff and I hope you do too. If you want to learn more, uh, there's a lot of resources at www.paulmerriman.com. We've got books, uh, fund recommendations, podcasts, videos. And if you go there and sign up for the free newsletter, you will be sent a link when it becomes available for a free copy of Paul and Rich's new book. We're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. And you know, it, even if the book's not your cup of tea, maybe it'll be the you know interesting to one of your friends. So if you sign up and you get the free copy, you can forward that PDF on when you got it. Um, I think it's a really cool book. It's got a, lo a lot of simple messages, um, great for young investors, but a lot of truths in there that are also relevant for experienced investors. Uh, disclaimer: I can't be your advisor. There are mistakes in this presentation. There are always mistakes. Um, we can't guarantee the accuracy of the data. So, um, but with that, hopefully we have enough time here for some interesting questions. So thank you for listening and thanks thanks for your time. Oh, great presentation and we've generated a number of wonderful questions. And, and I think uh, one thing to point out then, uh, that this, uh, this, is a, this is a handout that members can download. And I think it also has some additional slides and one of the slides might actually answer a question that have come up here, a couple from a couple members here. Uh, when it comes to rebalancing, you know, what do you recommend monthly, quarterly, annually? Uh, yeah, well, uh, are you still seeing my slides? Yes, we are. Okay, cool. I'll I'll pop this up. Yeah, this question comes up so regularly. I did create two slides on it, and last time I think it came up when we were with Paul and. 
what I said at the time is, you know, monthly, yearly, uh, rebalancing every other year, every five years, it probably doesn't make that big of a difference. And um, you can see that on this chart. Uh, if you look at the nominal compound annual growth rate, it, it varies between 11.9% for, by the way, this is the two fund for life strategy and accumulation. So you, for, for monthly, it's 1.9%. For yearly, it's 12%. For a rebalance every other year, it's 12.1%. Even at a rebalance of every five years, you're 12.4%. Um, if you go to no rebalancing, you might actually pick up an extra 1.5% or so, but it comes at a cost, right? What's happening over time, the less you rebalance, the more your risk gets out of line, right? So on the left-hand side with a monthly rebalance through to the every other year rebalance, these are all about 28, 29% maximum, or I'm sorry, yeah, the 48% worst case drawdown. But by the time you go across to the totally unrebalanced, it goes out to 54%. So that was accumulation. I also have one on, um, uh, let's see, this this is the four fund combo. Uh, and this is again accumulation, but it's a different, a different investment strategy and same thing. It just doesn't move very much over those. You know, I, I I don't get bent out of shape if people want to rebalance every other year or even every three years. I, I it it's not going to make that big of a difference. Yep. Uh, and I think also perhaps I think you might even cover this in some of your slides. But you know, people are concerned, you know, with bonds and and how they should allocate their bond allocation. You know, any thoughts or any advice or, or information regarding that? Yeah, I did. I did a look at the. Um, let's see. Got to minimize for a second so I can see my slides. Yeah, the, on the bond choice, the, yeah, this was in the material that we forwarded on. Um, on the bond choice, uh, we we have uh, used a variety of different bond recommendations in this presentation and on the website. So uh, we've got on this slide, I modeled the worldwide total bonds as part of a 60-40 with the ultimate buy and hold 13 fund solution, but that could have been Trev H or yeah, they would have been pretty close. I also modeled US total bonds, uh, intermediate term US government bonds, and then this more complicated strategy we use of 20% in short term, 12% in intermediate term and 8% in tips. And they don't, they don't, it's not that, the Kager doesn't move that much. You've got 10.6, 11%, 10.9, 11%. The one thing that kind of stands out is that the U.S. intermediate term government bonds delivered a reasonably high compound annual growth rate with the lowest 40-year drawdown, 33%. <clears throat> so, you know, is that significant on this chart? I, I don't know that I could say with great confidence that that's a meaningful difference, but it is the way it back tests. So that's that you know it's the data, and I'm I'm sharing the data, and you can decide whether it matters to you or not. Excellent. A number of people have asked specifically uh, regarding the Trev H, and perhaps you could just uh, help. We'll include show notes to indicate. Uh, where that term comes from and which fu which funds are in are are part of that, but perhaps you could just give a a quick uh, explanation of what Trev H is. Sure, I'll 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 go back and pull up that slide here. Uh, Trev H came from um it's by the way it's yeah it's this third one from the left. Uh, Trev H is the uh, I, I think it's the the uh, it's the name that the contributor goes by in the Bogleheads forum, who came up with this portfolio as an alternative to, a, say, a 13 fund or a 10 fund solution for equities. And the goal was to find a way with a smaller number of funds to get access to the to the same drivers of returns that the 10 fund more complicated solution has. So it, it comes out of Bogleheads. It comes from a contributor named Trev H. We use, we use his handle, if you will, because you know, we, we feel like it's a great contribution and we want to give him credit. Um, and it is simply a combination of two of the four funds out of the US 
four fund combo, U.S. large cap blend and U.S. small cap value, and then substituting the other two funds um, from U.S. to international. So you use international large cap value and international large cap blend. And it just it gives you that ability to have a half U.S., half international, um, half small, half large kind of a portfolio, but to do it with a very small number of funds. And and is it possible to ask you a personal question, Chris? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, the question here is, how old are you? Because they're asking because you mentioned retirement a number of times. Oh, uh, I'm 59. <laughs> I, I am an unintentional FIRE community member. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. I I always thought I was going to work until I was say 62, 65, but I work in Silicon Valley and you know Silicon Valley really does value fresh skills and you know we invested aggressively largely because when you know I think when I started work was about the time that the the pensions went away. And I remember HR brought us in and they sat us down and they said, pensions are going away. And instead you can have this thing called a 401k and you'll be able to save on your own. And my wife and I both said, we have no idea what the right amount to save would be, but we don't want to have too little. So we'll just maximize, we'll maximize the stock purchase plan. We'll maximize the 401k. We'll save it the most aggressive rates that we can. And thank goodness we did because, um, you know, I wasn't able to work as long as I would have liked. And when the time came to retire, we were quite comfortable being able to do it. So yeah, it's it's kind of funny the way these things happen. Yes, yeah, so currently the key is to uh, invest early, and that's probably the one bit of advice I'm sure everybody, every investor, uh, would give as far as looking back retrospectively. It would be to when they were younger to have aggressed invested more heavily and more aggressively probably, and let 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 time work in your factor. Um, a question here regarding. Uh, you know your your analysis is is very helpful as far as understanding different uh, market cap sectors and and factors. Uh, if a, if a person happens to have uh, individual stocks or bonds, any tips or recommendations on how they would go ahead go high, go around and classify those particular uh, security types? Yes, uh, and we ourselves still you know as much as I would advocate a young person to invest in mutual funds or index funds because of tax reasons, we still have individual stocks. So what we do is we use the Morningstar X-ray and so I, I go and I type the portfolio in and it'll tell us how much small we have, how much large we have, how much value we have, how much growth we have. And then I use Portfolio Visualizer to do some modeling on it as well, because um, I can take what comes out of the the X-ray at Morningstar, and then I can go and I can plug it in at, at Portfolio Visualizer and do a bunch of analysis to see, well, is this getting us where we need to go? Or are we taking too much risk? Is this going to uh, you know, make us lose sleep at night at the next market downturn? There's all kinds of things you can do with it. So I, I think there's a lot of reasons especially legacy reasons. If you have a lot of capital gains in a stock, uh, you probably don't want to pay all the taxes on that in one year, right? You And uh, and maybe you have a portfolio that came to you, you inherited it, and um, you the day you inherit it, it's easy to trade, but if you wait a little while, maybe you have some appreciated capital gains that are hard to, you know, you don't want to pay. So I, there's a lot of reasons for legacy that people may have stocks that, um, that they need to continue to manage. And I think a good way to peek in and look at how they would sit in this model that we just talked about is to use something like Morningstar X-Ray. Agreed. Um, when it comes to your analysis, you seem to be uh, looking a lot at small cap value. So a question here is, you know, what if I used big cap growth or big cap uh, value in lieu of small cap value? Why, why, why focus on small cap value? So, so the academics look for the when you, that slide that I had on factors. The academics look for the factors that drive increases in returns, and the value factor is value minus growth. So, if growth were a factor, it would not historically over the long haul it would not drive greater returns. It would drive lower returns. Growth is the anti-value, 
and big is the anti-small, right? They're, they sit on the opposite sides of the table. Now that doesn't mean it's bad to have some growth in your, in your investing plan if that's what's gonna keep you invested. It just means that the academics say that historically over the long haul, you'll get a lower return being in growth than you would be in value. And so the reason we don't have any growth funds in there, we have blend funds instead, is that blends are neutral. They don't, they're not negative value. So they're not taking any away from, anything away from the value tilt. Um, but if we put growth in there, it would basically offset the value. Now, a large value fund um, is gonna bring you the value factor, but not the size factor. Is that gonna help? The, the history says yes. The history says if, if you're patient, um, over time it should help. Um, so, yeah, that's fine. And in fact, on my website uh, or on the two fund for life pages of the Paul Merriman website, we analyzed the two fund for life strategy and we did analyze it for large value, for example, or I think we may even had uh, S&P 500 or an all equity portfolio in there to show that even it can make a difference. And I guess uh, as a follow-up to that, uh, you had some interesting points in your uh, article in the October issue of the AI Journal, uh, The Price We Pay for Being Different. And the observation you made is that uh, when it comes to investing in things like small caps, uh, it, 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 what happens frequently is that these uh, major bursts in return that impact your long-term rate of return, uh, they don't necessarily come evenly. No, and, and, and uh, the presentation Paul made last month used some telltale charts that Daryl had put together. That, and one of those is in my article, you know, prop to Daryl for, for creating that uh, really great analysis. And uh, it, uh, it shows that these factors that the academics point to that historically have delivered a premium uh, they can go through 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of time where they don't deliver the premium, where they just keep up or even fall behind for, for a long period of time. And in fact, right now, we're probably in one of those where large cap growth is having a great run and small cap value is having a bad run. Um, the it, Yeah, so it, it takes patience and it takes temperament. It takes, it, you know, the, the thing that always strikes me about any of these investing strategies, and the hardest part for us to assess when people ask for advice is what, what do you believe, right? What do you as an investor believe? Because that's what's gonna keep you invested. And for me, I've done enough of this analysis that I believe that having some of my portfolio in small in value is gonna help me out in the long run. Even as convincing as all the evidence is that I would probably be better off putting more of it in small in value, I'm just not comfortable with that. And so I'm kind of second guessing the history and the numbers myself, right? And and that's, sure. but, but if it keeps me invested, if it's what it takes to keep me invested, that's the right choice for me, right? And I, I think every individual investor has to really gut check and figure out, well, what do you believe? Because when everything goes south and it's not performing well, you're gonna have to stay committed to what you believe. These are, I have a number of more, I guess, tactical questions more so sure. than overall allocation wise. A number of questions regarding uh, recommended minimum distributions, uh, allocation between like say Roth IRAs and taxable accounts. Uh, any any thoughts or how would one go ahead and, and, and factor in whether or not an account is taxable or not or, or the type of account it might be? Um, a few, I mean, a few thoughts come to mind. Uh, one is that it, it, you definitely want to be tax efficient in tax location. So put high uh, the assets that generate high taxable income, like your fixed income, your bonds, your REITs, those should be in tax deferred accounts if possible so that you're not paying taxes on them every single year. Uh, even your, your high, if you have a Roth IRA, it's a great place to put your small cap value if that's what you believe is gonna have the highest growth over time because you've already paid tax on it and then you're not gonna pay tax when you take it out. Um, tax diversification, I think it's great to have some of your money in a taxable account, some of your money in tax deferred accounts, um, because you, you never know, you might be like me retiring earlier than you thought you were going to need to retire and being able to tap some money without having to pay penalties if you have to uh, retire early is a useful thing too. So 
Uh, require you, the RMDs. Was there a specific question around RMDs, John? No, just more, I guess more or less. What the, what should they do that with the money? And I, and I guess your point is that you, you you're concerned about the overall allocation of your portfolio, and then you want to take advantage of uh, whatever tax benefits a given account has. So it doesn't matter that as long as your overall portfolio matches your your desired allocation, that's probably the goal. Uh, whether yeah. or not it's equally distributed in every account doesn't matter. It's the overall look and feel, and you want to take advantage if you want to have high um, income generating accounts or, 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 or instruments. You probably want to keep those in your tax deferred account as long as possible, and then uh, those that are more tax efficient keep those in the tax in the, in the uh, accounts that are taxable. So it's really probably the big. Always look at the big picture. And uh, don't worry so much about having to duplicate that allocation in every account you own. Is that oh, fair? Yeah, that's that de definitely true. And that, two thoughts came to mind while you were talking about that. One is uh, that you know you don't have to spend your RMD. So if your RMD is higher than what your withdrawal rate is, reinvest it. Right, you can do that. And the other thought is you don't have to get all of your income out of income generating assets. Uh, you're, you're really worried about your total return. So if you have to pay yourself a dividend by selling some of a stock that doesn't pay much of a dividend that's grown too much, that's fine too, right? It's, there's nothing wrong with, it, as long as you stay within your target safe withdrawal rate, then there's nothing nothing wrong, especially if it helps you rebalance your account to sell some of the of one of your assets to generate the income you need. Yeah. And then a couple of questions have come up regarding the use of annuities or insurance products. Uh, how mm -hmm. do those factor into the process? I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm really not an expert on annuities, but I do know some people get really nervous about the idea of where their paycheck is going to come from in retirement. And uh, it can, it can generate a huge peace of mind. I have a good friend who upon retirement, he and his wife looked at the money that they had and realized they could take a, most of it, buy an annuity, and it would generate enough income that they would just be comfortable for the rest of their lives. And they liked that scenario. They have no children. They're not worried about leaving money to heirs and charities. Uh, for them, it, it, it has been a wonderful strategy. Uh, I know other people, though, who... Uh, would you know are more concerned with what they're going to leave to heirs and charities? Maybe they've oversaved, and so they're not really worried about the safe withdrawal rate. And annuity is probably not a fit for them. Um, so I, I think it's a highly personal thing. Um, yeah, it, it's it's hard to offer generic advice, but I think it's a useful tool that people should be aware of and consider if they're really nervous about where that guaranteed income is coming from in retirement. And uh, again, another probably more tactical question is. Uh, any, uh, how often do you recommend capital gains harvesting or, or capital gains loss harvesting? Oh, like, like tax loss harvesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't do it very well. Yeah. I just, <laughs> so, you know, me personally, I probably yeah. just do it before the year end and see if any of my holdings are, are, are suitable and then I find a replacement for it. That's how I do it personally. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Occasionally, I have had somebody flag me and say, "Hey, maybe it's a good time to do some tax loss harvesting." And it probably was, and I didn't get around to it. So I, I think the thing about tax loss harvesting that always troubles me is that it's a deferral of taxes because you reset the, you you lower the basis as well, right? So, um, you know, yeah, I. I think uh, your strategy of looking at the end of the year and figuring out where your opportunities are, that sounds like a great strategy. Sounds fine. Yeah. Yeah. And what we're talking about here is just basically if you have any big losses in, in any funds you're owning, um, you know, go ahead and, 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 and sell those at the year end and then perhaps invest that money in an equivalent new fund. But like you said, you're simply deferring <laughs> the whole yep. overall thing. Yep. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the things I've noticed and I, you know, and I'm sure it is probably worth pointing out is that, you know, Costs really always play an important role on our terminal wealth accumulation. And uh, I'm guessing there's no accident that you're looking at a lot of lower cost uh, funds or ETFs when it comes to these portfolios. Any 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 uh, feedback on that? Uh, yeah, co keeping costs low is critical because costs, 
you know, unlike your return, which is statistical, the costs are guaranteed, right? They come every year. You, you get them no matter what. Uh, so I think the key thing on the cost is make sure you're getting value for money. And in our selection of the best in class funds, if you go and you look at those, the best in class ETFs, some of them have a cost of a half of, you know, half a percent. And you might say, well, how can somebody who's advocating low costs say it's worth paying almost a half a percent? Well, it's it's because when you look at that asset class and you look at all of the funds available and you look at the premium that's expected for the factor exposure that it gives, it should be worth it, right? I mean, if I think I'm going to get 2% premium for something, is it worth paying a half a percent to get, uh, say, 75% of that 2% premium instead of paying a quarter of a percent to get only 10% of that premium? It's So it it's really important you're getting value for money. There are people who spend 1% per year working with an advisor because they really, really get value out of the handholding and the management of their funds. If they're getting value, that's fine, right? The, the, the thing is to be really careful that you're not spending money on expenses that you're not getting value for, right? So. Uh, I guess these are probably more a couple of questions just to remind everyone that this uh, – Presentation has been recorded, and then tomorrow we'll be sending out a, a email with, uh, you know, a link to the webinar recording and also to handouts, any kind of things that were mentioned tonight that might be part of considered show notes. Uh, I just want to remind that to everybody. And I see, keep seeing questions coming up, so I figure I'd go ahead and, and make that mention of it. Um, and you know, if someone is uh, in their early 80s and uh, they want to look forward from where they are now, uh, where do they start? Uh, yes. Hopefully, it's hopefully more of a question of allocation, probably more than anything else. But I'll let you go ahead. hopefully, they're optimistic and they're looking forward to another good ten to twenty years. Um, exactly. I, I hope that's where I am when I'm eighty. Good news is you probably don't need a forty-year safe withdrawal rate. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's bad news too. Uh, but it, you know, a twenty-year safe withdrawal rate is going to be enough. Uh, I, I, I think. Um, you know, by the time you're 80, you probably know an awful lot about what makes you nervous and comfortable as an investor, too, which is a wonderful place to start because I, I, I think at that point, a lot of people probably know what they want to do anyway, and they're looking for somebody to maybe be a sounding board. I, I am very fortunate. I've got two or three friends I can talk with about finance and investing, and it's really good to be able to use them as a sounding board uh, in a way where, you know, you keep it, you don't talk about how, you know, about dollars, but you talk about asset allocations and risks. And uh, those conversations are incredibly valuable and useful. And so I think somebody who's 80 and has all that perspective, I would encourage them to have that kind of a dialogue and, and uh, find somebody to talk to. And odds are, based on just their life experience, they're going to be in a pretty prudent spot to start with anyway. It's true. Often just simply just talking about it with someone else, just vocalizing it uh, kind of helps clarify one's own thoughts as far as what's even impacting them. And so that's great mm -hmm. advice, Chris. Um, now, if someone, again, here's another question here. Um, you know, they, they're, they've just retired. They've got a big lump sum. Perhaps they sold a business. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, th the difficulty people always have, I think, is, you know, when they have a big lump of sum of money to invest is that 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 probably it's that first step. It's that fear. Do you do you, yeah. you know, do you simply go all in? Do you do you go in slowly? Do you, you do you test the water? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? This is something I can relate to personally because when my parents passed away and we sold their house, I actually I, I listened to all of the uh, stuff I heard on the news that said the market's overvalued. It's really expensive, and in spite of all of my training and knowledge. I just couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to invest at all. And I kept thinking to myself, well, the market will go down. And six months later, I invested it all as a lump sum with the market up considerably from where it was, you know, the, at, at my first opportunity. So the smart thing to do if you're really skittish, I think, is to dollar cost average. Just say, okay, I'm going to put it in over time because then you know, if today it's the cheapest, I, I get some of today. And if a month from now it's the cheapest, I get some of that, right? And so it, it smooths out 
I, I've, I think it was in one of Larry's books, he called it time diversification. And, and I love that. It's, it's a great way to add another level of diversification to your portfolio. So you do that dollar cost averaging in and you get time diversification. Um, I, in retrospect, I would have been much better off had I done that dollar cost averaging um, and even just said, I'm going to do it over six months or a year or whatever. And I, I think that's a very prudent approach for most people. Academics will tell you that your expected return or outcome is probably higher if you just invest it as a lump sum but the opportunities to regret it for buying it too high are higher as well. And I think that's what most people are trying to avoid and that's why the dollar cost averaging works out from a behavioral finance standpoint. And I see we're running a little bit uh, long here, but we'll try to find a few more questions before we sign off for the night. Um, let's see here. Looks like we've answered quite a few of these. Um, a lot of, I guess a lot of people are really concerned here that uh, you know, looking back at historical uh, bond rates of return, uh, you know, the, the fear is really you know bond rates are very low. Uh, you know, how you know how realistic or how representative are historical bond rates of return relative to what to expect in the near term future? I, I think that's a very real concern, and if somebody has that concern when they look at any of these returns, they could derate them by two or three percent, right? You could you could say the future is in in their belief structure is going to be a lower return, and there's there's good reasons to think that. Um, personally, I, I think the markets over the long haul are unpredictable, and the biggest reason we have the bonds in the portfolio isn't the return; it's the uh, it's the safety, it's the, the mitigation of that downside risk, right? So it, will the returns, the compound annual growth rates might be a little bit lower moving forward across the board for all of the portfolios we looked at tonight. But I think the general trends of adding bonds into the portfolio, reducing the drawdown risk, that's, that's probably still gonna be true because um, bonds are just less volatile on a short-term basis. And if you need those breaks, if you need to have something in there to uh, to lower that drawdown risk, you know, there aren't many choices uh, it, it, you, you pretty much need to have. You can be in cash, but then you've got inflation working against you and you're not getting paid for it. Um, if you're in bonds, it might be a low return for a while, but maybe it'll go up over time as well. You know, so it's hard to say. And uh, we'll close off with this question here. And uh, someone must have been gone to your website. I don't see any newsletter sign up link on the website. Where do I look? Very top. So at the very top of the page uh, of the website, there's something that has uh, a little box that says email, and you can type your email in there. And it says sign up, I believe. So at least that's where it was an hour or two ago <laughs> when I looked. <laughs> very good. Thank you so much. It's still there. Wonderful presentation. Hey, Thank Ryan. You. Yes. Um, so, Chris, I, I just wanted to uh, ask if uh, folks had uh, individual questions for you, um, if you uh, if you had an email um, or a place to, to go look for, for folks. Sure. It's uh, Chris K. Patterson, P-E-D-E-R-S-E-N at gmail.com. OK, great. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit. Uh, sorry, this is not cooperating with me um, about our uh, upcoming webinar. Uh, let me. Share my screen here. Hopefully, folks can see that. Okay, great. Um, all right. So uh, I wanted to thank everybody for attending tonight's webinar. Uh, replay of the presentation, as John said, will be available tomorrow on AAII's YouTube channel, along with uh, links to tonight's handout and uh, the other uh, resources that uh, Chris discussed. Uh, this will be sent to your email address. Uh, we do have some uh, upcoming uh, one upcoming webinar to highlight. Uh, which you can sign up for at www.aaii.com slash webinars. Uh, next week, uh, our own uh, Charles Roplet is going to be putting on the next in his uh, wealth uh, building series, putting investing uh, preferences to work in your portfolio. I believe that is uh, concerning uh, developing your own uh, financial plan. Don't miss that. And I did want to say that uh, we do uh, have been putting on these webinars uh, every Wednesday, um, and we are continuing to do so in November and December. Um, so I uh, don't change that channel. Stay tuned. Uh, we will have more webinar uh, content to share with you. Uh, with that, I wanted to thank both Chris and John for the time tonight and you, the audience. Uh, we, we wouldn't do this without you. So uh, with that, we wish you good health and good wealth. Good night, everybody.
Good night. Thank you so much.